Okay, so if it's okay with everybody, I'm going to go ahead and get started because I have quite a few slides for, I think everybody knows me, but for those of you who don't know me, I'm Dr. Bienvenue. I'm one of the fourth year residents. And today we're going to be talking about the topic of primary care as it pertains to the obstetrician gynecologist. Um, so as an introduction, the reason that I picked this topic is OBGYNs are known to have a, uh, have a tradition of providing primary and preventative care to women. And primary care, we know, emphasizes the services and principles of providing health maintenance and preventative services in order to aid in the early detection of disease. This presentation focuses on primary and preventative care as it relates to the routine assessment for asymptomatic women. It covers special concerns for specific women based on their age and risk factors, and it also emphasizes counseling that can help encourage uh, women in maintaining a healthy lifestyle and in minimizing health risk. Um, this presentation will cover the initial diagnosis and management of several chronic disease processes um, that are commonly unveiled during routine assessment and providing preventative screening. Um, once a problem has been identified, intervention can either be in the form of behavioral modification, um, monitoring, or treatment or referral as needed. Um, OBGYNs do often serve as the primary medical resource and counselors uh, for a wide variety of medical conditions. However, um, it's important to remember that all clinicians, regarding, uh, regardless of the extent of their training, do have limitations in their knowledge and skills and should seek consultation at appropriate times when necessary. Um, the recommendations in this presentation are all evidence-based and centered on review of pertinent and current established uh, clinical practice guidelines. So by the conclusion of this presentation, you should all be able to identify age-appropriate screening tests and provide preventative health maintenance for a variety of age groups, formulate a differential, uh, excuse me, formulate a diagnosis and initial treatment plan for commonly encountered disease processes, um, make appropriate recommendations to a referring physician when appropriate, and consider unique obligations in special populations. Um, this presentation will cover routine age-appropriate screening and disease prevention for our women of all applicable age groups, um, as well as the role of the OBGYN in diagnosis and initial management of commonly encountered disease processes, including those listed above. Um, throughout this presentation, there are helpful links for quick references that are included in uh, orange hyperlinks, and also there's a separate handout that has some helpful links on the side as well. Um, for the purposes of this presentation, the routine gynecologic components of the annual exam will not be covered. Um, this includes breast and pelvic exam, screening guidelines for cervical cancer, breast cancer, and STD screening. Um, although these topics will not be covered in the scope of this presentation, uh, routine health maintenance as it applies to the OBGYN, as we know, does include the evaluation of sexual, uh, sexuality, sexual function, sexual activity, STD risk and prevention, menstrual disturbances, family planning and contraception, um, preconception counseling, menopausal management uh, when suitable. Because these topics are frequently the focus of other presentations, they have been intentionally admitted from, omitted from this presentation. So the first topic we're going to cover is routine screening, which plays a vital role in the early detection and prevention of disease. The following slides were composed by reviewing the current guidelines of all applicable major uh, organizations and associations um, for a helpful systematic comparison of selected guidelines in regards to routine screening. Um, one may refer to this website, which is the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services National Guideline Clearinghouse. And this uh, site provides a up-to-date, nearly comprehensive review of recommendations by all major groups and organizations. So it's good to have. Uh, around because the guidelines change frequently. So first we're going to talk about colorectal cancer. This is important because it's the third most com common cancer type and the second leading cause of cancer death in the United States. Um, our current levels of screening in this country lag behind those of others and it's been estimated that if we obtain population goals for colon cancer screening we could save approximately 18,000 lives a year. All major groups agree that screening in the average risk asymptomatic individual should begin around age 50, with one exception you'll see later. Um, recommendations as far as acceptable screening methods differ slightly among groups. Um, the U.S. Preventative Task Service, uh, excuse me, U.S. Preventative Services Task Force, American College of Physicians, American Academy of Family Physicians, 
um, the American College of Preventative Medicine and the CDC all agree that screening for colorectal cancer in an average risk asymptomatic individual should begin at 50 and should be accomplished through one of the following methods, including annual screening with high sensitivity FOBT, flex -sig with uh, every five years with FOBT every three years, or colonoscopy every 10 years. Um, in contrast, the American Cancer Society and the U.S. Uh, Multi-Society uh, Task Force for Colorectal Cancer and the American College of Radiology all jointly recommend that screening an average risk asymp asymptomatic individual can be accomplished through one of six methods, including FOBT or immunohistochemical testing annually, Flexig every five years, barium enema every five years, CT colonography every five years, colonoscopy every 10 years, or fecal DNA at an unspecified interval. ACOG does currently uh, endorse the guidelines recommended by the American Cancer Society and uh, agrees that one of the six listed uh, methods are acceptable. Um, although they emphasize that colonoscopy is the preferred method, one thing that differs uh, in ACOG's recommendations is they do recommend that screening for African American women start at age 45. Um, it's important to remember that FOBT requires two or three samples of stool uh, be collected by the patient at home and returned for analysis. A single stool sample collected by digital rectal exam in the office is not adequate for detection of colorectal cancer or colorectal screening. Um, current available, available tests that meet specifications for high sensitivity FOBT <laughs> include the SENSA testing mechanism, and this is the um, cards that we have at this facility. So the ones we have in the clinic right now are the high sensitivity ones. So whenever choosing a, a screening method for your patient, it's important to realize that um, this should kind of occur on the individual level. Adherence to a screening regimen will be more important um, than will be which regimen is selected. So because several screening tests have similar efficacy, um, efforts to reduce colon cancer deaths should focus on implementation of strategies that maximize the number of individuals who get some type of screening. Um, so the different options for colorectal cancer screening tests are variably uh, appreciated by patients. So eliciting patient preference is an important step in improving adherence. Ideally, uh, this is a shared decision making between the clinician and the patient, um, and you should incorporate information on the availability of the test, the quality of the test, as well as the patient's preference. Um, current data are insufficient to predict adherence to any specific screening method over the other at this time. So this slide depicts the average cost of a 10-year period for three popular screening methods, the colonoscopy, flexig with FOBT or high sensitivity um, FOBT. The costs um, in this slide were determined in a study by Thomas uh, Rudders, and uh, they're based on information from the Commercial Claims and Encounters database on 2000, in 2007. So a colonoscopy as of the year 2007 ranged anywhere from $190 to $1,213 with an average cost of $432, um, FOBT an average cost of $50, and Flexig a combination of $280. Um, as you see in the column to the far right, um, the estimated wait times that are listed are based on this current institution. Um, so just a little information is the GI department here does not currently perform any type of screening endoscopic procedure for colon cancer. Um, they only do diagnostic colonoscopies for patients with, you know, any other indication. The family medicine department is providing endoscopy for colon cancer screening, but only if the patient meets certain criteria. And those criteria are if the patient is considered high risk, um, if they have a first degree relative with colon cancer or if they're over the age of 65. Yes, sir. Um, I hate to interrupt, but I will. I, I got permission from Richards first. Okay. She says I interrupt everybody. <laughs> you give excellent presentations, so I don't think it, you, it, this affects you any. But I'm just looking at the dates, 2007, 2009. And you know, we have all of these major healthcare changes. 
are you going to touch on that in here at some point? No, sir, I, I didn't think so. so I, do we have any idea how that's going to end? Because look at the waiting times there, six months. Yes, sir. Um, when I spoke with, as far as the timing of, you know, the six-month wait period for a colonoscopy or Flexig, they were in the process of trying to overbook. They had a surplus, like a pool of patients that were two months out. And they were in the process of overbooking several procedures so the wait time would decrease, but it has not yet. And that's just here, though. That's just this here. is here. The wait times are but here. The costs are average. Um, what about nationally? The wait times nationally, I don't have that information. I figured it would, you know, be better for us to know here. Well, again, you provide, you, you give excellent presentations, but you know. Considering all the rapid changes that are taking place, yes, sir. it would have been helpful to bring that out and yes, just kind of look at the national trend. Yes, sir. Um, as, you do an job. as far as wait time, I don't have that information, but the average cost over the 10-year interval, this is actually new information because I originally did this, planned to do this presentation in December, and that was based on the 2004 data, and they have since then come out with the 2007 data, so that is the most up to date that we have. Did it go up or down? It's about the same. It was like a couple dollars different. Okay, who thinks it's going to go down? <laughs> <laughs> so, again, um, so the family medicine will only do screening colonoscopies for certain people if they're considered high risk, due to a first degree relative, or if they have um, Medicare and are over age 65 with no prior colonoscopy. Um, if the patient, and again, the average wait time for that is six months, if the patient has private insurance, then they are actually referring them to Shumpert to get them done more expeditiously. So, um, now we're going to talk about diabetes. ACOG and the American Diabetes Association currently recommend routine screening of blood glucose in women starting at age 45. Um, currently, acceptable methods for diagnosis and screening include hemoglobin A1C, fasting plasma glucose, or a two-hour 75-gram oral low GTT. Um, in some patients where the patient has classic symptoms of diabetes or presents in DKA, random blood glucose levels may be used to establish a diagnosis. Um, both agencies re, uh, recommend repeat screening every three years if the initial resor results are negative. Um, screening may be indicated at an earlier time um, or more frequently in the presence of certain risk factors including obesity, family history, sedentary lifestyle, a history of uh, gestational diabetes or a prior infant weighing more than nine pounds, um, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, or impaired glucose tolerance. Yes, sir? Can I just point out same thing in pregnancy. If you see a patient at 16, 18 weeks and they have risk factors, you don't need to wait till 24 weeks to screen them. And it's the same thing they're saying here. Go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> Along the same lines, ACOG and the U.S. Preventative Task Force also recommend routine screening with a lipid profile assessment starting at age 45 and uh, doing this every five years. Um, the screening may begin earlier at age, between ages 20 and 45 if there are risk factors present, um, which are similar to the previous ones we listed, family history, a history of premature cardiovascular disease, diabetes, uh, low HDL, obesity, or multiple uh, coronary heart disease risk factors, including tobacco and high blood pressure. Um, for osteoporosis, the American College of Preventative Medicine, North American Menopause Society, and U.S. Preventative Task Force, and ACOG all recommend bone mineral density testing for women aged 65 and older, regardless of any risk factors. Um, this is accomplished via DEXA scan. The, um, they all also recommend postmenopausal screening in women younger than age 65 in the current of certain risk factors, which we'll go over. All groups agree that in the absence of new risk factors, screening should not be performed more frequently than every two years after the initiation of treatment. So um, based on the guidelines of these groups, the presence of these risk factors is appropriate to screen postmenopausal women for osteoporosis before age 65. Again, if they have a medical history or a personal history of uh, fragility fractures, a BMI, 
um, excuse me, a body weight less than 127 pounds, uh, or any other medical causes of bone loss. They're a current smoker, they're alcoholic, or they have uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Um, just kind of another few things to touch on as far as uh, bladder cancer, current evidence is insufficient to uh, across the board to assess the need for routine bladder cancer screening at this time, and that includes ACOG. In regards to thyroid disease, um, the U.S. Preventative Task Force concludes that the evidence is insufficient to recommend for or against screening for thyroid disease in adults. While the American Thyroid Association uh, does recommend TSH testing starting at age 35, then every five years thereafter. Um, the American College of Physicians, American Academy of Family Physicians, and ACOG do not currently recommend routine thyroid screening in asymptomatic individuals before the age of 50. Um, they do recommend that physicians be aware of the patient and their symptoms and risk factors for thyroid disease and evaluate when indicated. Um, they do recommend starting at age 50 and screening every five years for asymptomatic individuals. So now we're going to kind of switch gears a little bit and talk about um, health maintenance. The OBGYN is often, again, the physician that women go to not only to access their routine care but also preventative care. Um, routine visits should be viewed as opportunities for the OBGYN to educate and counsel patients regarding identifiable risk factors and lifestyle issues that place them at risk for illness or injury. So the following slides will focus on aspects of disease prevention specific to uh, health and recommendations are for not again for non-pregnant women. Um, at every visit a thorough uh, history including risk assessment should be obtained as well as pertinent parts of the general physical exam. This includes height, weight, and blood pressure. A BMI should be calculated at each visit. Um, adjustments may be necessary based on the presence of risk factors um, that are elicited from the patient's history. Um, efforts of health maintenance should focus on weight control, cardiovascular fitness, and reduction of risk factors associated with cardiovascular disease and diabetes. So as the first part, we're going to talk about immunizations. As physicians who provide general well women examinations and preconception counseling, we have the opportunity to counsel women on the need for immunizations. An immunization history should be elicited at each annual exam, and we can provide vaccinations or referrals to vaccine clinics um, when indicated. The clinician should attempt to gather a complete record um, at each visit, including risk factors indicating the need for immunization, and should attempt to attain previous records. If there are doubts about past immunization, it is safest to assume the woman has not been immunized and to initiate the vaccine series. Um, Up-to-date immunization records for our patients can be accessed by Googling Links Louisiana. And I have that on that separate form, and the user ID and password is on there. And you can access every patient's records as long as they've been vaccinated. At a, even if it's a health unit or anywhere, they're all on there. So, and I checked my own, so I know that you can. <laughs> so, um, ACOG currently recommends the following routine immunizations for women with risk factors by age group. For the 13 to 18 age group, they recommend Tdap once before uh, between ages 11 and 16, HPV for uh, one series for any individual not previously immunized, and meningococcal vaccine before entry into high school or if not previously uh, immunized. Age 19 to 64 age group, they recommend Tdap every 10 years, HPV series for anyone less than 26 not previously immunized, and a flu vaccine annually beginning at age 50. Those patients uh, 65 and older, again, are recommended to have Tdap every 10 years, flu vaccine annually, and the pneumococcal vaccine once. Um, additional immunizations, including hepatitis A and B vaccines, are recommended for patients um, with certain high-risk factors. I wanted to call your attention to, for hepatitis B vaccination, it lists more, anyone with more than one sexual partner in the last six months a recent STD in all clients in STD clinics. So that's one that we may um, be under vaccinating for in regards to the acute clinic and patients that we see here. Um, the flu vaccine is recommended for any patient who desires the vaccine and those at high risk for transmitting the illness to others. 
this in also includes patients with chronic heart, lung, or metabolic diseases or those who are uh, immune suppressed. Um, again, it's uh, immunization recommendations can change quickly. So for the most current uh, and up-to-date guidelines, this is the website, uh, cdc.gov slash NIP. Um, and the current adult immunization schedule can be found at the uh, address listed below. And that's also in your handout. So um, during the annual exam, patients should also be assessed for general fitness and encouraged to exercise at each visit. Um, as fitness has been shown to have a positive effect on longevity and quality of life, all women should be evaluated for obesity by calculating a BMI at each visit. And the physician should recommend appropriate intervention or referral to promote healthy lifestyle and healthy weight. Um, current recommendations include encouraging at least 30 minutes of aerobic exercise um, most days of the week. And also on EPIC, you can, um, as long as the patient has a recent height and weight entered under their vitals, all you have to do is type dot BMI and it will calculate an update BMI. Um, calculating BMI can give valuable information about the patient's nutritional status. Um, those who are below or above the normal range uh, require more extensive evaluation and counseling and should be assessed for any type of uh, systemic disease or an eating disorder. Uh, dietary planning should involve developing a nutritionally adequate um, diet using a tool such as the food pyramid. Um, primary care uh, doctors should furnish their patients with nutritional information and question them about diet and lifestyle um, at each of their visits. So the diet recommended should be, of course, high in fiber and low in fat and sodium. Uh, for more information pertaining to healthy eating habits and physical activity recommendations, there is the CDC website below. Some of this I'm kind of going through quickly because I have a lot of things I wanted to cover. So if you have any questions, I can answer them at the end. Um, so the next thing we're going to talk about is cardiovascular disease. It's the leading cause of death in U.S. women. Therefore, the OBGYN should use the routine annual exam to educate, screen, and monitor, and treat women um, to reduce their risk of morbidity and mortality for, due to cardiovascular disease, such as myocardial infarction and stroke. Um, patients should be counseled about risk factors that increase their risk of disease, including their family history, abnormal lipid profiles, high blood pressure, obesity, PCOS, and a lack of exercise and smoking. Um, women at risk should be encouraged to modify their lifestyle to reduce these risks by eating a low-fat, low-salt diet, controlling high blood pressure, um, exercising to promote weight loss and cardiovascular fitness, and of course, stop smoking. It is important uh, to remember that for patients with risk factors, such as obesity or hyperlipidemia, diet and exercise help prevent cardiovascular disease at any age and constitute the first line of management before initiating any drug therapy. So as previously mentioned, patients should be assessed for their risk of cardiovascular disease at every visit and non-modifiable risk factors for cardiovascular disease include um, age greater than 55, a first degree relative with uh, premature cardiovascular disease or race, um, Factors that can be modified, of course, include smoking, sedentary lifestyle, obesity, and dietary modifications, um, incorporating, um, excuse me, excessive stress in certain medical conditions, such as those listed above in red, are also viewed as modifiable risk factors. Um, as a vital part of health maintenance, the clinician should, uh, be, should address the following issues with patients, as indicated depending on their age and their risk factors and their medical history. Patients should be educated regarding the risk factors and symptoms of cardiovascular disease at every routine visit and appropriately screened for abnormal lipid profiles. Blood pressure should be measured again at each visit and patients with diabetes should be counseled on the importance of maintaining normal glycemia. Um, patients should be counseled regarding heart attack symptoms including sudden intense pressure in the, or pain in the chest shortness of breath, chest pain that radiates to the shoulders, neck or arm pain, and feelings of lightheadedness, fainting, nausea, or sweating. Um, smoking cessation and weight control should be encouraged at each visit as well. And patients should be treated or referred um, as risk factors are identified. So the following slides focus on the role of the, 
the OBGYN plays in the diagnosis and initial management of common chronic disease processes which are frequently discovered as a result of the routine screening and health maintenance that we've already talked about. Um, information in these slides has been obtained from a review of current uh, clinical practice guidelines and sources for these clinical practice guidelines including links when available are indicated on the header slides again in orange and uh, I think some of them are on the separate handout. So. First, we are going to talk about obesity. Um, again, obesity is defined as a BMI greater than 30 and is the fastest growing health problem in the U.S. Approximately a third of all U.S. women are obese and the incidence has increased sharply over the last 20 years. Um, obesity is more common in low income and minority women and the presence of obesity is associated with increased morbidity including type 2 diabetes, hypertension, infertility, heart disease, gallbladder disease, osteoarthritis and a variety of other conditions including cancer, including breast cancer, uterine cancer and colon cancer. Um, due to the high incidence and significant morbidity associated with obesity, appropriate interventions or referral to promote healthy weight and lifestyle should prompt um, should be prompt at the time of diagnosis. So during routine assessment of a woman's uh, BMI, if it's calculated to be 30 or greater, the severity of the obesity class should be noted. Um, and again, we talked about how to do that at Epic is dot BMI. Additional laboratory testing uh, may be appropriate. Um, to identify comorbidities. However, no single laboratory test or diagnostic evaluation is indicated in every patient with uh, obesity. Test um, and further evaluation should be performed based on the patient's current symptoms and risk factors, um, including a clinical index of suspicion. So some testing which may be indicated would include lipid panels and blood glucose measurement. So again, the uh, first line intervention includes counseling and supportive improvements in diet and physical activity. An initial approach should improve the importance, stressing the importance of weight loss and assessing the patient's readiness to make behavioral changes. You should set an initial goal, which includes um, loss of five to 10% of the total body weight during a six month period. Um, if available, referral should be considered when the resources of the clinician are insufficient to meet uh, the patient's current needs. Um, if the patient's BMI is 40 or higher, or if they have a BMI of 30 with other comorbidities or failed prior interventions. Uh, pharmacotherapy and um, Surgery may be appropriate for some women. There are some current FDA approved medications available um, for patients with a BMI of 30 or higher and um, or a BMI of 27 and higher if they include certain risk factors and these include Orlistat, which we all know how that works. <coughs> Dr. Baker knows this question. <laughs> uh, uh, Lucertin or Belvic. Quincia, <laughs> Adapex or Suprenza. Um, when surgical methods have failed, surgical, excuse me, when non-surgical methods have failed, surgical intervention is an option for some patients with severe BMI, uh, excuse me, severe obesity and a BMI of greater than 40, patients with a BMI of 35 or higher with certain comorbid conditions, and these patients should be referred to and evaluated by a comprehensive bariatric uh, surgery team. So next we're going to talk about hypertension. This is important uh, because it affects 50 million people in the U.S., including one in four adults. The incidence of hypertension increases with each decade of life. Um, after menopause, half of the U.S. female population has high blood pressure and the prevalence continues to increase thereafter. Um, hypertension increases the risk of cardiovascular events, including MI, congestive heart failure, stroke, peripheral vascular disease, and renal failure. Um, untreated hypertension is a major cause of mortality with risk directly proportional to the degree of the severity of the hypertension. Um, above is the National Heart, and Lung, and Blood Institute classification for uh, blood pressure for adults age 18 and older. In 2004, um, they published the seventh report of the Joint 
National Committee on Prevention, Detection, Evaluation, and Treatment of High Blood Pressure endorsing um, an optimal blood pressure as being less than 120 over 80. They call for more aggressive treatment for patients with high normal blood pressure, especially when complicated by other conditions. In this report, a category of prehypertension was added, um, and the patients in this category are identified as being at an increased risk for developing hypertension. It is important to keep in mind that a single blood pressure measurement is insufficient for a diagnosis of hypertension and that classification of blood pressure and therapeutic intervention uh, normally should be based on the average of two or more readings at at least two or more visits after an initial um, high blood pressure is obtained. Uh, laboratory assessment in women with a new diagnosis of hypertension should include your analysis, CBC, BMP, lipid profile, and EKG. If the EKG indicates uh, ventricular hypertrophy, then an echo can be considered. Um, based on current ACOG recommendations, OBGYNs can assume a pivotal role in the prevention of uh, hypertension-related morbidity and mortality. Um, we, can, we can and should incorporate suggestions for modifying lifestyles. We previously talked about into counseling patients to prevent the development of chronic hypertension. Um, identification of women with prehypertension and treatment for stage one hypertension or within the capabilities of the OBGYN. However, more advanced stages should be referred to specialist consultation. Um, the ultimate goal of antihypertensive therapy is the reduction of cardiovascular disease and renal disease. Target blood pressure is 140 over 90. However, in patients with diabetes or high blood pressure or renal disease, the target blood pressure is 130 over 80. Um, the first line treatment for a new diagnosis of hypertension includes weight loss and in those who are overweight and obese, um, also sodium restriction no more than 100 millimoles per day, um, a low saturated fat diet, increase in physical activity uh, such as brief uh, or brisk walking for approximately 30 minutes a day most days of the week, or moderation, um, excuse me, and moderation of alcohol consumption including no more than one alcoholic drink per day in women. Um, after implementing lifestyle modification, if the goal blood pressure is not met, then uh, pharmaco excuse me, pharmacologic therapy should be added. Um, thiazide type diuretics should be used as the initial therapy for most patients with hypertension, either alone or in combination with one of the other classes. Um, a usual starting dose of this medication would be hydrochlorothiazide. 12.5 or 25 milligrams once daily. Um, thiazide diuretics have been demonstrated, uh, excuse me, have demonstrated beneficial, to be beneficial in randomized control outcome trials. Um, if a drug is not tolerated or is contraindicated for any reason, one of the other classes should then be considered. Um, most patients who are hypertensive will require um, two or more antihypertensives to achieve their blood pressure goal. Um, when blood pressure is more than 20 diastolic, uh, systolic over 10 diastolic above the goal, uh, consideration should be given to initiating therapy with two medications um, as separate prescriptions or a fixed dose combination. Um, the initiation of drug therapy with more than one agent has been shown to increase the likelihood of achieving the blood pressure goal in a more timely fashion. So once an antihypertensive drug therapy is initiated, most patients should return for their follow-up and adjustment of medications at monthly intervals until their blood pressure goal is reached. Um, serum potassium and creatinine should be monitored at least one to two times yearly. And after the goal blood pressure is uh, met, then follow-up visits can be arranged anywhere from three to six month intervals as appropriate. So next we're gonna talk about dyslipidemia. Abnormal cholesterol le uh, levels are firmly linked to atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease. Um, standards as to the identification of candidates for testing and frequency uh, differ among different organizations as we already mentioned. The current, again, the current ACOG guidelines recommend that women without risk factors have a lipid panel starting at age 45 every five years. Um, early screening, again, may be appropriate in certain individuals, as previously discussed. Um, the relationship between LDL cholesterol and uh, levels, excuse me, LDL cholesterol levels and heart disease risk uh, are continuous over a broad range. 
So the current practice guidelines adopt the classification of LDL cholesterol levels shown in this table. Um, a basic principle of prevention um, is that intensity of risk reduction therapy is adjusted based on the person's absolute risk. Hence the first step in determining if LDL lipid lowering uh, therapy is needed is to assess the person's risk status. Um, risk assessment requires the measurement of their LDL um, and identification of any other risk factors including smoking, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, excuse me, HDL less than 40, or a history of premature cardiovascular disease in a family member. Um, an HDL, um, one important thing to remember is an HDL of greater than 60 is counted as a negative risk factor and removes one risk from the previous total count. So the categories of highest risk, of course, are those that consist of a heart disease equivalent um, and, or those with heart disease. Um, heart disease equivalents include diabetes or peripheral arterial disease, the presence of a um, abdominal aortic aneurysm or symptomatic car uh, carotid artery disease. Calculating the patient's risk factors using the chart in the previous slide determines the patient's LDL goal. And with this goal in mind, the clinician will be able to determine if um, LDL lipid lowering therapy is needed. So the two um, major modalities of LDL lowering therapy include, of course, therapeutic lifestyle changes and uh, drug therapy. Lifestyle modifications, again, are centered around restrictions in saturated fat, uh, with it being less than 7% of total calories. Uh, decreased cholesterol intake less than 200 milligrams daily, weight reduction, um, increased physical activity. And this table defines LDL cholesterol goals and cutoff points for initiation of lifestyle modification um, and for drug consideration. So. At the time of diagnosis, patients should be counseled on dietary and lifestyle modifications and referred to the appropriate provider. Um, and to a registered dietitian or other nutritionist for a nutritional intervention. Um, approximately three months after lifestyle modification, if the LDL goal is not achieved, at that time a drug treatment can be began. Um, a portion of the population whose risk for developing uh, cardiovascular disease is high and will require um, lipid lowering drugs in addition to lifestyle modification. Um, when these are prescribed, attention to lifestyle changes should always be maintained and reinforced. Um, when a lipid lowering agent is initiated, the usual drug that will be started is a statin. Um, of course, there are other therapies available. In most cases, the statin should be started at a moderate dose, and then uh, lipids should be rechecked in six weeks. An example of a moderate dose statin would be Provostatin, 20 milligrams, which is available currently on the $4 list at Walmart, um, $4 for a 30-day supply. Um, if the goal LDL has not been achieved within six weeks of therapy, this dose can be increased. Um, current labeling for all statins requires baseline measurement of liver function, including AST and ALT. Um, prior to starting the medication and then annually. So we'll talk about diabetes next. Um, the American Diabetes Association and ACOG again recommend that all individuals be screened every three years um, beginning at age 45. And this again should be considered at a younger age if certain risk factors are present that we already talked about. There are several different tests that uh, can be used in making this diagnosis, and these include a hemoglobin A1C, um, a fasting uh, plasma glucose value, or a two-hour 75-gram oral glucose tolerance test. Um, in the absence of unequivocal hyperglycemia, it is important to remember that these results should be always be confirmed by repeat testing. So a single abnormal test does not require um, intervention that test should be repeated within a three-week time period prior to making the diagnosis. So uh, once a diagnosis of diabetes is established, um, the goal of management, again, is to ensure normal glycemia in the patient. And if symptoms of polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia, weight loss, blurred vision 
are present, immediate drug therapy may be necessary. Otherwise, dietary control, weight loss, and active exercise programs should be instituted. The patient should be referred um, to the appropriate physician and to a nutritionist for a thorough uh, dietary counseling. Nutrition control is an integral, integral, integral component of care for all women with diabetes. Um, initial treatment does consist of dietary and lifestyle modification initially, which includes high fiber, low uh, saturated fat, low sugar, and low carbohydrate diet, weight loss, and an active ac exercise regimen. Um, treatment is focused on the patient, is uh, a patient-centered approach, which takes into account the patient's preferences, and also the costs and potential side effects of each um, medication. Uh, pharmacologic therapy with metformin is recommended in addition to lifestyle uh, modification and counseling and support for weight loss. Um, metformin, if, if not contraindicated and if tolerated, is the preferred initial pharmacologic agent for type 2 diabetes due to its safety, efficacy, and low cost. Um, if glycemic control is not obtained within six months after dietary and lifestyle modification, this medication should be started. Um, the initial starting dose for metformin is 500 milligrams twice daily. Uh, the renal function should be checked prior to beginning uh, metformin and then again once annually thereafter. So for osteoporosis is important because approximately 18, excuse me, yeah, 18% 18 of U.S. women over age 50 have osteoporosis and another 37 to 50% have low bone density. Um, the most common type of fracture is a vertebral fracture. It is largely preventable complications in menopause with available screening strategies and pharmacologic interventions available. Um, risk factors for developing osteoporosis are many and include all of these listed. However, estrogen deficiency uh, is characterized by early menopause, which occurs before age 45, or bilateral oophorectomy. Um, other medical conditions that are associated or may be associated with osteoporosis include HIV, COPD, Cushing syndrome, eating disorders, um, insul insulin dependent diabetes, MS, RA, liver disease, and uh, weight loss. Medications uh, such as aluminum, anticonvulsants, steroids, um, immunosuppressants, the list goes on, are also associated with osteoporosis. So it's important to screen your patients for those things. Um, preventative measures, of course, include adequate calcium and vitamin D intake, uh, weight-bearing exercise, smoking cessation, and decreasing alcohol intake. Um, the most widely recommended method of diagnosis for osteoporosis in the U.S. is DEXA scan of the lumbar spine and hip. Um, this is the only test that has been validated for osteoporosis diagnosis. Um, the T-score comprises the patient's um, bone mineral density. Uh, compares the uh, patient's bone mineral density to that of a young healthy adult. Um, T-scores are categorized as normal low bone mass or osteoporosis. T-score less than or equal to negative 2.5 at any site um, is sufficient to establish the diagnosis of osteoporosis. Um, some DEXA scans also report a Z-score which compares the patient um, to the bone mass of that of a woman of their same age, but only the T-score should be used for the purpose of diagnosis and treatment of osteoporosis. So um, the fracture risk assessment tool was developed in collaboration with the World Health Organization to predict the patient's risk of osteoporotic fractures. Um, it can predict the risk in a 10 year, uh, in the next 10 years is kind of how it goes. Um, it has been validated in more than 11 different cohort studies and the clinical risk factors that they test in, or that they assess includes age, sex, BMI, uh, previous fracture, um, history of a prior hip fracture, smoking status, the use of current steroids, alcohol use, and other causes, uh, secondary causes of osteoporosis. Um, the results are specific to the patient's age and gender. In the U.S., the FRAX has been most widely used to aid in decision making regarding the treatment initiation when low bone mass is present. Um, it is recommended that DEXA reports include a FRAX score only when bone mineral density is in the low bone, uh, low bone mass range. Treatment should be considered when there is a 3% risk of hip fracture or 20% risk 
of a major um, osteoporotic fracture or both within the next 10 years. So this slide is an algorithm uh, for the screening and treatment of postmenopausal women of hip, uh, hip fracture and this is in the um, ACOG practice bulletin. And I'll let you look at that. Um, before initiating treatment, it's important to consider the possibility of secondary causes of osteoporosis, which include rheumatolog uh, rheumatologic, autoimmune, endocrine, GI disorders, and lifestyle, um, uh, lifestyle factors and other medications. Um, bisphosphonates are generally considered the first-line therapy. However, multiple other classes of drugs are available and are approved for treatment of osteoporosis. Um, one particular bisphosphonate may be selected uh, on the basis of patient preference or a certain route of um, delivery or even for insurance coverage purposes. In combination therapy of multiple drugs is not recommended. We're going to talk briefly about depression. Um, major depressive disorder may begin at any age um, and is of greatest, the age of greatest onset is at 20. Um, in half of women, the onset of depression occurs between the ages of 20 and 50. Um, mood disorders, especially depression, are the most common psychiatric illnesses in women. Um, the risk of developing depression during a woman's lifetime is approximately 20% in contrast to men, which is 10%. Um, the risk is highest for women in their reproductive years with a prevalence of 8 to 10%. Um, the healthcare professional working with women, as healthcare professionals working with women, we have a unique advantage uh, to identify and diagnose depression in these patients. If identified, depression can be actively treated in up to 85% of cases successfully. Um, this treatment may include medication, uh, psychotherapy, or both, and clinicians will need to provide follow up care for any patient. Um, that has not been referred elsewhere. The likelihood of recurrence of depression is 50% after a major episode of depression, and this continues to increase with each occurrence. Um, the presenting symptoms of depression, as we all know, are frequently somatic or behavioral, and sometimes uh, can be attributed to an organic uh, condition. Psychological symptoms, such as depressed mood, crying spells, loss of interest, normal activities, or suicidal thoughts, or obvious, but a high uh, clinical index of suspicion is needed um, in order, uh, and also uh, a complete differential diagnosis um, is needed. Um, the clinician should be alert for symptoms of depression and incorporate routine screening questions into their annual physical exam. A history should include uh, questions concerning previous uh, psychological problems, including hospitalizations or prior suicide attempts. When the initial screening uh, test is positive or does suggest um, a possible depressive disorder, a more, a more comprehensive history is in order. Um, sample uh, questions appropriate for depression screening include the questions uh, listed on this slide. Over the past two weeks, have you felt down, depressed, or hopeless? Over the past two weeks, have you felt little or no uh, pleasure in doing things you previously enjoyed? Um, so this slide just kind of lists the uh, major, the criteria for a major depressive disorder. We all know it includes five or more of these. However, it's important to remember that uh, one of those must be either depressed mood or diminished interest, and it should be present for at least two weeks. Um, the OBGYN clinician should be alert uh, for additional symptoms of depression, including but not limited to the loss of interest or pleasure in sex, the persistent physical symptoms that do not respond to treatment, such as headache or digestive disorders or chronic pain, um, exaggerated or prolonged depressive symptoms following common reproductive events, including miscarriage, stillbirth, infertility, hysterectomy, mastectomy, childbirth, or menopause. Um, it's also important to keep in mind other conditions and distinguish them from depression. Um, these are just some differential diagnoses that have common presenting symptoms as depression. And patients who report with symptoms of mania may have bipolar disorder and medical treatment will be different from those of depression. This is important because um, in these cases, uh, referral to a psychiatrist is highly recommended and antidepressant medications can induce mania and should be used with caution. Um, based on current ACOG guidelines, recommendations for referral is suggested in patients who present with 
um, a suicide risk, bipolar disorder, um, any psychotic symptoms including delusions or hallucinations, um, if it's a pediatric or adolescent patient, if there is a presence of uh, substance abuse, if the clinician themselves is not comfortable, or um, if there has been failure to respond to previous interventions. Um, the OBGYN may elect to treat depression in some individuals. Um, selection of an appropriate agent may be affected by safety and adverse uh, profiles and cost and should be a collaborative decision between the patient and the doctor. Um, there are many different classes of antidepressants um, which are effective for relieving symptoms of depression and the choice of antidepressant depends on the factors including whether the patient takes other medications um, or has any other medical conditions which may interact with the antidepressant. Um, due to the safety of the medica medication and a lack of uh, very significant side effects, SSRIs have been typically used as the first choice antidepressant in OBGYNs. Um, in our field, it's important to note that there are sexual side effects of these medications, including loss of desire, diminished arousal, and difficulty achieving orgasm. Um, these may occur with prolonged use of SSRIs and adding another drug such as uh, bupropion uh, may decrease these side effects. Um, MAOIs are usually not a first choice of depression um, because of the potential for fatal interaction with other, other medications and only practitioners with substantial experience with these medications should prescribe them. Uh, tricyclic antidepressants have been associated with arrhythmia and sudden death and uh, targeted screening and obtaining a normal EKG prior to administering this medication is uh, suggested. Um, medications, again, like as a broad umbrella statement, should be considered for patients with moderate or severe symptoms, uh, prior positive response to medication, recurrent depression, or for patients who prefer medication to psychotherapy. Psychotherapy alone is often effective in treating patients with mild uh, depression and physical uh, excuse me, psychotherapy referral should be considered in patients with mild depression uh, when it is the patient's preference. So it's important just to familiarize yourself with the different category, all those different drugs, and know a little bit about each category and determine which one you're safe, you feel most comfortable administering. So next we're going to talk about eating disorders. These affect more than uh, 5 million people in the U.S. Um, each year. Anorexia, nervosa, and bulimia, and uh, binge eating are the common uh, disorders characterized by um, disturbances in eating behavior. Um, these can have life-threatening consequences, including um, death due to starvation, cardiac arrhythmias, heart failure, and suicide. 95% of patients diagnosed are female and they're usually between the ages of 12 to 18, but this does occur in older women and has been reported in uh, patients younger than age 12. Um, this is a diagnosis of bulimia and anorexia. Um, so diagnostic criteria for anorexia should include um, refusal to maintain body weight at or above a normal range. Um, intense fear of gaining weight or becoming fat even if the patient is underweight, disturbance in the way body weight or shape is experienced, undue uh, influence of body weight or shape on the patient's self-image, um, or denial of the, serious, um, uh, the seriousness of the current low body weight. Um, amenorrhea is also a symptom. So patients with eating disorders may uh, commonly present with any of these complaints. Um, in addition, patients may present with physical exam findings, which include a, BMI, a low BMI, hypotension, um, bradycardia, arrhythmia, hypothermia, or uh, perianal erythema. A high index of clinical suspicion is necessary for recognizing this disease, these disease uh, processes. Once an eating disorder has been sus uh, suspected or diagnosed, um, the clinician should refer the patient to the appropriate practitioner for nutritional rehabilitation and psychological intervention. Um, these may be performed in an inpatient or outpatient basis depending on the severity of the disease determined by the specialist. Next we're going to talk about substance abuse. Um, this is important because it affects 22% of all women uh, who are current tobacco users. Um, 
Although the prevalence of the use of substances varies, it presents in uh, all socioeconomic, cultural, and ethnic groups. Evaluation of a patient for substance abuse requires uh, application of a high prevalence of wide um, and wide distribution among the population. Direct questioning of patients about their tobacco use, alcohol, and drug abuse uh, is preferable. Because um, substance abuse and dependence are medical conditions, healthcare providers have a key role to play in the prevention and treatment of these disorders. And this includes screening patients with questions, providing education and brief intervention, and providing referral when appropriate. Um, cigarette smoking, again, is the largest preventable cause of premature death and avoidable illness in U.S. women. Uh, smoking contributes to deaths from cancer, cardiovascular disease, respiratory disease, and for more information um, on the detrimental effects of tobacco, you can go to this website. Um, the Agency for Health uh, Care Research and Quality recommends brief smoking cessation intervention known as the five A's for screening and uh, treating tobacco dependence. This model is applicable to um, outpatient visits only. Um, after assessing smokers for their willingness to quit, um, physicians, office staff can encourage smoking cessation and arrange the proper follow-up. The five A's of uh, brief smoking cessation intervention include asking about tobacco use, um, advising the patient to quit in a clear, strong, personalized manner, um, assessing willingness to make the quit attempt, um, and assisting the patient in this attempt. It is also important to remember to arrange follow-up. Um, the schedule follow-up contact, uh, preferably within the first week of the patient's uh, determined quit date. So pharmacologic treatment for um, smoking cessation should be offered to all women attempting to quit unless they are contraindicated. These products increase the quit rate uh, 1.5 to twofold, regardless of the treatment type. Um, or in the setting, Zyban is one medication that's used and is started at the dose of approximately 150 milligrams daily for three days, then increased to BID dosing. Um, this medication should be started within one to two weeks before uh, the patient's predetermined quit date. Um, the cost per day for Zyban is approximately $3.50, which is comparable to the range of anywhere between two and ten dollars per day for uh, commonly used nicotine uh, replacement products. Um, excessive alcohol consumption um, is also, also can contribute to more than 100,000 deaths in the U.S. per year. In addition to motor vehicle accidents, suicide, homicide, heavy drinking also contributes to death, uh, deaths due to heart disease, cancer, stroke, and increased risk from uh, malignancy and liver disease. <clears throat> Um, OBGYNs have an ethical obligation to learn and use a protocol for universal screening questions, um, brief intervention and referral for treatment, um, direct questioning of patients about their substance abuse is vital. Um, and these patients prescribing uh, potentially addictive medications should also be avoided. Um, once uh, one well-known um, screening method for substance abuse is the CAGE questionnaire. And I think we're all familiar with this, but in this model, two yes responses indicate the possibility of a substance uh, abuse problem and uh, like alcoholism and should these patients should be appropriately referred and this needs to be investigated further. So lastly, we're going to talk a little bit about special populations just briefly. Um, routine screening and health maintenance issues previously discussed remain important in the adolescent. Um, population and should be addressed. However, um, adolescents are at increased risk of injury to other health jeopardizing behavior. Um, data from the 2007 uh, Youth Risk Behavioral Surveillance Report indicate that nearly 72 percent of all deaths among adolescents and young adults aged 10 to 24 resulted from one of these four um, mechanisms above. Uh, guidance from physicians can greatly facilitate a young girl's healthy, healthy and safe transition into adulthood, and physicians should provide preventative guidance to both parents and adolescents during routine visits, such as the importance of wearing their seatbelt. 
Um, adolescent girls uh, should first visit the OBGYN between the ages of 13 and 15 with subsequent annual visits thereafter. In some cases, this visit may be appropriate to begin earlier based on any concerns of the, pa uh, the patient or the parent. Um, care should be delivered according to the individual stage um, of physical, sexual, and psychological and cognitive development of the patient. Um, confidentiality is, a frequently, is frequently identified as a major obstacle in adolescent patients in the delivery of health to these patients. Therefore, this should be addressed um, at their initial visit. Um, practitioners, again, have the responsibility to provide quality care to all women regardless of their sexual orientation. Um, being a lesbian or bisexual woman does not inherently affect an individual's health status. Um, there are no known physiologic differences between lesbians and heterosexual women. However, the following health behaviors or risk factors may be more common among uh, lesbians and bisexual women, including nulliparity or low parity, uh, lower use of oral contraceptive pills, higher rates of alcohol and smoking, um, increased rates of obesity, and less frequent um, screening. These behaviors and risk factors should be um, considered when determining appropriate medical interventions because lesbians and bisexual women may be at an increased risk for breast cancer, lung and colorectal cancer, type 2 diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. Uh, standard comprehensive obstetrical and gynecologic care is recommended for these women. As with all patients, again, the OBGYN should provide routine health maintenance and preventative care to transgendered individuals. Um, some health risks are increased in this population. Um, some of these, uh, some patients may be involved in high risk sexual behavior and activities which place them at a higher risk for HIV and AIDS. Um, hormone therapy to maintain acquired uh, gender characteristics also can place the transgendered individual at risk for certain health problems, including um, cancer, heart, and liver disease. By uh, the year 2030, individuals older than 65 will make up approximately 20% of the population. OBGYNs and other clinicians who care for older women uh, play an important role in promoting their health um, and preventing disease by ensuring that the recommended preventative screening is also carried out in these groups. Um, special needs in this group include communication issues, um, assessing the patient's visual and hearing deficits early on in the visit, and making appropriate adjustments in volume and pace. Um, comprehension needs to be assessed. Um, memory can be aided by stating clearly the important information and keeping the information brief and relevant. And the patient's functional status and ability to function in everyday life is crucial uh, point of evaluation for all examinations. This includes their motor function, cognitive and uh, mental function, and also their gait balance. After that very long presentation, in conclusion, the practice of obstetrics and gynecology encompasses a very, encompasses a very broad spectrum of care um, directed to many aspects of women's health. Um, at times, the OBGYN practitioner often serves as a woman's point of entry into the healthcare system um, and her provider of primary care and a source of continuity in her health care. So OBGYN practice requires an approach um, to care that recognizes the broad range of women's health issues and their uh, care needs. Um, to be successful in this uh, capacity, however, it's important to remember that a collaborative relationship with others providing health care to women of all age groups is critical. The end. Do you have any questions? All of my um, that was extremely thorough. Um, very good. I do have a question about kind of two different areas. You had discussed immunizations, but you didn't mention the zoster vaccine. I did not. Um, um, the zoster vaccine is optional and it's recommended for a one time dose over age 65, I believe. Um, and do you ask them about history of chicken pox or history yes. of previous vaccine? That's also, yes, that's also, yeah, the vaccination history is what you need to obtain. And then also clinical exposure pertaining to chickenpox. Links is a very helpful website if you live in the state of Louisiana. Yes, it also indicates on links, uh, it says historical next to uh, chickenpox. 
whether or not you've had, if you have not had the vaccine, it lists whether or not you've historically had the illness. Do you know what year they started the chickenpox vaccine for I don't. adolescents? I don't. Um, and then my other question had to do with um, uh, Chantix. You mm -hmm. mentioned some other cessation methods for mm -hmm. tobacco and I mean, did you run across anything about that? Are you comfortably using it? Um, I did see where it is recommended and it, again they said pharmacotherapy has been shown to be as effective if not more effective and cost effective than other methods of smoking cessation and that should be offered to everyone. I know with Chantix there is a, it can cause um, some visual disturbance and some psychological disturbance, insomnia, and that, that is a big warning sign if your patient experiences any of those mood changes or any of those symptoms, it should be immediately discontinued and it's not like don't decrease the dose, don't let them continue it for a little while and see how it goes, but immediately discontinue it. That's the biggest thing that stood out to me. And do you set up any follow-up with these patients that you put on these medications? Yes, so that's also one thing that you should do. They say that you need to go through and talk to the patient about it. You need to set up a goal and pick a start date. It doesn't have to be that day, but you pick a start date. You see them prior to that start date, then initiate. they initiate the medication then, and you should see them at least one or two weeks after the start date, and, and however you clinically see necessary after that. To monitor their progress. You guys hold on to this, this handout for your board exams. There's a lot of this stuff, like the five A's for smoking cessation, the K's, like all yeah. that is stuff. That and I know they always ask fracs too. I've seen that so many times, like the different components. I tried to put a lot of the stuff that he was going to be on the board. Hopefully, it'll be on. I was just going to see if Dr. Baker can explain to us exactly what it is that happens when you take Orlistat. What is Orlistat? I don't know, Dr. Baker. Do you know what happens? I heard um, you cannot trust Flatus. <laughs> okay, thank y'all. I also put breast, some of the guidelines for breast cancer screening in the end. I didn't talk about them because it was like too much talking, so.